So um, without further ado, let's get started on some of these invasive bee pests. The first one we'll start with is called small hive beetle. And a uh, small hive beetle is uh, an ovalish uh, beetle, brownish. Notice how it's got these clubbed antennae and it's quite small. It's one fifth to one fourth inch. Now you will find um, some beetles that are not small hive beetles sometimes in hives. However, those ones don't do the damage that small hive beetle does. Can be difficult to differentiate the two though. So if you are ever in doubt, um, you can submit uh, a specimen to our lab um, and we can uh, tell you whether or not you have small hive beetle or not. Right below that is the larvae. And you'll notice uh, the larvae is kind of a cream color. It has three sets of legs, uh, which all insects do. And then it's about seven sixteenths of an inch. So just a little under half an inch. The damage uh, that this pest can do is pretty substantial. So this photo here is the small hive beetle larvae feeding on honey. And you can see it's making quite a mess here. It should be noted though that uh, small hive beetle larvae can also eat pollen as well as bee brood. So if you aren't a beekeeper, I am going to try to uh, clarify terminology that is used in beekeeping so that you don't get lost. Um, bee brood is basically just baby bees. So uh, eggs, larvae, and pupa. Here's another uh, picture of some damage. So this is what's called slime or slime out. And this is basically fermented honey and excrement that's left behind by the beetle. And uh, again, this makes a heck of a mess and um, it uh, makes the, the honey unusable and um, unmarketable. The current distribution of small hive beetle is that about 30 states, it is established and most of these are east of the Mississippi. That being said, uh, the state of Utah has had a run-in with small hive beetle and we will talk about that. Where it is established, this is considered a pretty severe pest. It isn't uh, a pest that will uh, kill a beehive. However, um, if, they're, if the hive is under some sort of other stress, these insects will take advantage of that situation and they can hasten the death of the colony. So it is of great economic importance. And we ask that if you find small hive beetle or something you think looks like small hive beetle, to please report it to us. So here's uh, the life cycle of small hive beetle. We start out at the top here um, and we've got mama beetle here and she's laying um, some eggs in, um, in some comb. However, they also lay eggs in the crevices of the hive. A couple days later, these eggs will hatch and you'll start to get larvae. And these larvae are what's going to eat through the bee brood, the baby bees, as well as the pollen and the honey. About seven to 10 days after that, they're actually gonna leave the hive. These little larvae are gonna crawl outside the hive and they're going to complete their next life stage, pupation. And they're going to do this in soil that is around the hive. And that's gonna take a couple of weeks for that to, to, to complete. Once they become adults, they will emerge from the soil and they will crawl back into the hive. And then um, basically uh, more, more of these are in the hive, they mate and the whole life cycle repeats. Now there is one thing I want to know about this life cycle that is relevant to um, the story I'm going to tell you about Utah's run-in with small hive beetle. The pupation stage of this insect requires moist soil to um, successfully pupate. That's going to become a little bit more relevant here as uh, we go on with this presentation. Before we get to that though, um, let's compare small hive beetle to a, another common pest that's in beehives, wax moth. Wax moth was one of the first pests that was described by Utah beekeepers when they settled this area. And it can be um, difficult sometimes to separate the larval stage of these insects apart. So once again, we've got um, the small hive beetle on the left here. And notice it has these three true legs. And as I mentioned, all insects have three sets of legs. Max size, we already went over that, seven sixteenths of an inch. And then it has these little spikes on the back. It's noteworthy that these beetles congregate into groups. So you'll see those larvae all kind of together as we did in that one photo where they were eating the honey. And then they can also leave behind this slime or slime out. Another thing that is interesting and I think quite noteworthy is that these can be very difficult to squish. If you pick um, one of these larvae up and try to squish it between your thumb and forefinger, um, you're gonna have difficulty smashing it. 
And that is a very good characteristic to help you differentiate small hive beetle from the wax moth. So let's look at the wax, wax moth. Got a wax moth larvae here. And um, again, it has the, it has the uh, three set of true legs, like all insects, but notice that it also has these, what are called pro legs. And if you've ever looked at a caterpillar, you've probably noticed this, um, a moth caterpillar or a butterfly caterpillar, it appears that these insects have all these other sets of legs in addition to the three that they normally have. Well, in reality, those back legs are not actually true legs. They're not segmented. They're just kind of fleshy stubs that help with locomotion. Another difference, uh, max size of this is three-fourths inch. So these can get bigger than small high beetle um, when the uh, larvae fully mature. Notice that it doesn't have any spikes on the back. And these pests are, tend to be scattered throughout the hive. Um, so you won't see them aggregating in, in groups like you do with small hive beetle. Instead of leaving slime, it can leave webbing. And these ones are easy to squish. So we point these out just so that um, if you are a beekeeper and you're noticing things in the hive, these are just some kind of quick and easy ways you can tell the difference. You can, of course, always submit samples to our lab if you're not sure though. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about small hive beetle history. It begins in the United States in 1996. And this was the first detection in the United States uh, in North Carolina. Now the uh, native range of small hive beetle is basically sub-Saharan Africa. So this was the first place in the United States. And then in 1998, just two years later, um, it was estimated that 20,000 colonies of honeybees were infested with the small hive beetle. And what that tells me is that it had been there um, before 1998. It just hadn't been detected yet. But that detection in North Carolina it sure put it on everyone's radar. In 2000, um, it was detected in North Dakota, and that was basically the, the furthest, most Western um, detection uh, up to that point. And I'm not gonna go through every single state that um, it infested. Um, I, I don't think that's that relevant. Um, we already discussed that basically 30 states, most of them east of the Mississippi are infested with this pest. Um, but let's kind of get what to, is more relevant to our state here. So in 2016, we had our first confirmed detection in Utah, and that was in Washington County. Now that being said, I have talked to many beekeepers who claim they have um, had small hive beetle in their hives inside of Utah. There was also this story uh, many years ago of a um, truck that crashed and it had uh, beehives on it. And supposedly there were small hive beetle um, in the hives of this truck. Um, but you know these stories um, are kind of hearsay and legend. Many of them preceded my time here. And so um, none of them were actually confirmed cases. I don't doubt that small hive beetle um, had been introduced to Utah before 2016, but basically 2016 is the first time we found it, we properly identified it, and we kind of looked into um, whether or not it had distributed. So the following year, we started what's called a delimiting survey. And I've got a slide to kind of show you what that is. But a delimiting survey, simply put, is whenever you find an invasive species, you basically try to determine how much that, whether it's an insect or something else, has spread, and kind of where the frontiers of the infestation. And like I said, I'll show you what that kind of looks like on the next slide. Later in that year, after we had done our delimiting survey, we had found a single specimen in a single hive in Davis County. In 2019, we had some detections in Miller County. 2020 was the first year since the 2016 we hadn't found any, and we actually haven't found any small hive beetles since then, which is really good news. And uh, I'll talk more about why that might be in a, in a little bit. Well, let's talk about this delimiting survey we did. Um, so you see some circles here and a yellow star in the middle. Um, th this is just represents a survey that we did in Washington County when we found um, small hive beetle, uh, basically the very next year. And I don't have a map underneath all of these icons. And the reason for that is our program really prides itself in uh, protecting the privacy of beekeepers we work with. And so if I was to show you the map of where we found it and kind of like the work that we did, it might tip you off to who the beekeeper was that had it. And that is not what we want to do. We want beekeepers to be able to come to us and um, you know, bring things to our attention and know that we're not going to be blabbing about who it might be. 
So you might just have to imagine a topographical map underneath this, okay? But um, the yellow star is basically where the small high beetle was found in 2016. And then all of these concentric circles represent um, the miles away that, um, from that point. And I will note that small high beetle is an excellent flyer. So it's uh, not unheard of for this uh, pest to be able to fly these distances. So the first thing we did in this delimiting survey is that we contacted all the registered beekeepers we had in this area. And um, that, I'll get to this later again, but uh, it's a good reason if you are a beekeeper to, um, to be registered with the state. It's so that we can contact you um, in emergency situations like this. So we basically contacted all these beekeepers and they are symbolized by these blue stars. And you may be wondering, well, was there any um, beekeepers, you know, to the left or to the bottom of this? Um, there were not. And that's because we basically have some topographical features that um, don't allow hives to be there. So if you're wondering why are there gaps in where there's beekeepers, that, that's why. But basically all these beekeepers were contacted um, that had disclo disclosed locations in these places. And most of them um, were willing to let us put these traps inside their hives. So for small hive beetle, there is a trap and it's this little plastic uh, doohickey. It has a reservoir in it that you pour oil into. And then it has these little slits that the, the beetle can crawl into. They crawl in wanting to eat the oil and then they get stuck in there and die. So we put these in hives um, all throughout uh, this area. And we were pleasantly surprised to find in that 2017 delimiting survey, no detections. Um, no detections beyond what the air, the hives that it was already found. In. Now, I will note that later that year, uh, I want to say later that fall, um, we did find a single specimen in a single hive in Davis County. So um, you might be wondering, well, did you do a delimiting survey um, in, in Davis County? Um, we did not. And the reason was um, it had gotten, if it was in Washington County and it was in Davis County, we kind of had two ideas. One was, you know, if it's, if we have um, infestations that far apart, you know, it might be spread throughout the state such that we're not really going to be able to do too much about it. But what we were also considering is that it's well known that small high beetle um, is, it doesn't really prefer dry climates like the ones we live in. Um, as I mentioned, that pupil stage needs moist soil to effectively pupate. So you might be asking, well, gosh, well, why did you even bother doing anything with this? And the reason comes down to what my boss likes to say. Um, sometimes the insects don't read the book. So sometimes we do um, suitability models and we do all this work to try to figure out where an insect might or might not establish. And we have a, you know, what we think is a pretty good idea, but it turns out the insect didn't read the study. It didn't read the book. Insects just are going to live where they're going to live, right? And so because this was our first confirmed case, we really wanted to get an idea of whether this would spread or not. And what became clear in subsequent years is that um, it doesn't seem that the habitat here in Utah is very suitable for small hive beetle. Now, there are some concerns that um, we modify landscapes as humans. Um, you know, we irrigate, um, we irrigate things. And um, so we can modify the environment in such a way that um, maybe this insect could uh, effectively complete life cycles. Um, however, it just doesn't seem like between the experience we had, you know, from 2017 onward, and then all the other reports, you know, that um, small high beetle had been introduced here, that there's just enough of that modification of the environment going on to sustain a stable population. That being said, we still would appreciate if you report um, if you think you have found this uh, pest inside your beehives. And the reason for that is small hive beetle is regulated by a number of states and California counties. And um, without getting too far into the weeds of things, many beekeepers that are uh, commercial, that do it for a living, they will move their hives from state to state. And um, being in a, a state that basically has established populations of small hive beetle, can sometimes create barriers to entry for those folks. And so what we uh, like to pride ourselves on doing here is uh, continuing to track this pest, identifying it when we find it, and then um, just making sure that it isn't taking hold here because we would like to continue being known as a state that is free of small hive beetle. Okay, let's move on. 
to something else, something that is not uh, in the United States and uh, is not in Utah for that matter. So this is called the tropolelops mite. This is a parasitic mite, it's an arachnid, and it is very tiny until it's uh, brownish. And you can see right there, it's uh, 0.5 millimeters wide. I am um, American, so I use inches, but it's 1 25th of an inch. So very, very tiny. And the damage that it does is it's kind of like a, it's a parasite, so it's a little bit like a vampire. Um, these mites uh, basically attach onto bees and they feed on what's called the hemolymph and the fat body. Hemolymph can be thought of as kind of like bee blood. And the fat body is basically a tissue that is used to store and release energy as the insect needs it. So this feeding in itself is uh, very damaging to the bee, as you might imagine. If you have parasites on your body and they're feeding on you, that is going to be a problem. But in addition to the feeding, um, this mite can also transmit viruses. And these viruses can be very deadly to the honeybees. The current distribution of uh, the tropolelops mites, and I should say mites, uh, plural, because this is a genus. This is a complex of mites. It's not one specific species, but uh, um, a couple different ones. And uh, basically, you can find these in tropical and subtropical Asia in their native range. However, they have been detected in Papua New Guinea, as well as Kenya. Kenya, so a completely different continent, right? Um, so these things are moving around, which is quite concerning. And the economic of this, uh, importance of this mite is potentially very great. One thing we know about this mite is that it does, the populations can increase more quickly than one of the mites that we already have in the United States and is currently the most severe pest. And that mite is called the Varroa mite. We will talk about Varroa mite uh, later on. Um, but just know for right now that this one potentially could be worse than the worst pest we already have. So that's very concerning. Of course, report this one if you think you found it. A little bit about the life cycle. And for those of you who maybe aren't beekeepers, we'll just briefly go over what the bee life, the honeybee life cycle looks like. Basically, it starts when a queen bee lays an egg. The queen bee is the only one that will lay fertilized eggs. And the egg hatches about three days later, and you'll have what looks like a little worm that comes out. It's, it's maggot-like. So basically, it looks like a little worm, white worm, and it doesn't have legs. And this um, little uh, worm will basically be fed by its older sisters. So its older sisters are worker bees, and they are going to feed it. So unlike, say, like a caterpillar, you know, that goes out and munches on some leaves um, on its own, um, honeybee babies can't do that. They need their older sisters to feed them. So the larvae will grow as it's being fed and then it will eventually pupate. And you can think of this very similar to a butterfly or a moth, where you know the butterfly hatches as an egg, becomes a caterpillar or a worm, and then basically forms a cocoon. So in the case of the honeybee though, unlike the, you know, uh, the butterfly caterpillar that forms its own cocoon or chrysalis, um, the honeybee baby is gonna need a little bit of help. So what happens is the adult, workers, the older sisters, are going to cap off um, the cell that the baby bee was laid in. And I'll show you what these cells look like on the next slide. So once that's capped off, that's when the bee will form, uh, it, go through its pupil stage, and then eventually it will emerge as an adult. And this all, if you're a worker honeybee, this takes about 21 days. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about the life cycle, let's talk about this tropolelops mite and how it reproduces within the colony. It basically requires um, brood, baby bees, in order to complete this life cycle. So the, one of the key parts is day eight. And that's like I said, where we've got a, an egg that was laid in a cell and the larvae is hatched out and it's just starting to be capped by the older sisters. The older sisters are basically just barely kind of starting to seal it up so that it can become a pupa. But that mite will sneak in there and hide underneath that larvae just before it's capped. They don't like to go in there beforehand because the adult sister bees, they might find the mite, okay? So once that's capped, then that mama mite is going to lay eggs. Okay, so that's the next step here. 
So we got on day 10, the mama triple A my laid her first egg. And she's basically going to lay uh, additional eggs each day until she gets to four eggs. These eggs hatch and they start feeding on the larval bee or the pupil bee. And on day 16, that's when you're going to first see your first adult triple A mite that wasn't the mother that went in. And this is going to repeat so on and so forth until you have three to four. And then eventually, as that adult bee comes out, we're going to have more mites come out. Okay, so I told you I was going to show you some of these cells that the um, baby bees are, are, are put into. So on the left here, you'll see a picture of this is what's called brood comb. And for those of you who haven't um, uh, worked in a beehive before, I'll try to explain as best as possible to you. I think most people are familiar with honeycomb. And this is essentially the same thing. It's basically this hexagonal shaped um, holes that are all grouped together. And um, it's formed of beeswax. And unlike honeycomb, where we put honey into it, basically brood comb is used by the queen bee to put her eggs in. So that whole life cycle we saw basically occurs in what's called brood comb. And you can see a picture of that to the left now, or on this uh, video to the left. Now, that being said, this video to the left, this is infested with the tropolelops mite. You can probably see them crawling around. You see these little tiny mites crawling around all over the top of it. One thing to know is that we can actually see the damage that's being created by this tropolelops mite. Okay, now let's go back to thinking about a butterfly. If we have an egg and then we become a caterpillar and then we form a chrysalis, Imagine you found a butterfly chrysalis and there was a big hole in it. What do you suppose the prospects of that becoming an adult butterfly is? Not likely, right? If you have a big hole in the chrysalis, then basically that butterfly can't complete its developmental cycle. Well, the same is true of bees. So basically a pupa, until it, a, an adult comes out of it, should basically look like a cell that has that kind of brownish red capping. So anywhere you see a brownish red capping over a cell, that is a pupil bee that is basically in the proper stage of development and is likely to emerge as an adult. Now you'll see these cells though, on the other hand, that have these kind of like white looking bees in them. And those are pupil bees and the capping has been removed, okay? And this is not good for the baby bee, okay? Because if the capping's removed, it can't complete its developmental cycle. So you might be wondering, well, is it the mites that have removed this capping? Did they bite through it? It's actually not the case. Interestingly enough, it's the older sister workers that remove the capping. And you can kind of see this on the video to the right. So we have a couple of honeybees here and they have uncapped the pupa and they are remo re removing the, the pupa from that cell. Why have they done that? Look very closely at the, the white pupa, and you'll notice a mite crawling on it. That's actually the Varroa mite. That's not triple A but just for the purposes of demonstrating why they do this, uh, it works just the same. What has happened is the development of the mites underneath the capping has set off an alarm to the older sister worker bees, and they know that there's mites inside of there. So they have uncapped that, and they're trying to remove that infested bee. This does not kill the mite, but it does interrupt up their brood cycle and it can help to reduce the population. So what you see on the left with all those pupil bees being uncapped is the adult worker, older sisters doing their best to try to stop this mite infestation from taking over. And this can have really um, dramatic repercussions on the colony's future because these baby bees are needed to replace bees that die later. Now you may be saying like, well, why do the bees do this? Well, it can be a really effective strategy um, for dealing with mites, especially um, where both tropolelops and varroa are originally found. However, European honeybees are not as good at doing this as the natural host of the tropolelops and varroa mites. So by the time they get around to doing this, the mite populations are too high and it's already too late. So I'm gonna show you on the next slide what the mites look like kind of more closely up and also where these things are coming from. On the left, we have the Varroa mite. We already talked about that one and we'll talk more. This came from what's called the Asiatic honeybee. 
And on the Asiatic honeybee, Varroa mite is not a problem. Like I said, it has these um, what are called hygienic defenses, basically where it's sniffing out um, bees that are in their pupil stage and, and trying to find those mites, pulling those bees out and, and interrupting that mite life cycle at a point which it can prevent that mite population from getting worse. And they also have a few other uh, really neat defenses. Okay, the tropolelops mite, this came from what's called the giant honeybee. And again, the giant honeybee has really impressive defenses against this, uh, this parasite. Unfortunately, though, both of these pests can infest the European honeybee. And that's, that's the only honeybee we have in North America, is the European honeybee. And the European honeybee has not co-evolved with these parasites. And so the defenses are there, but they're not as good. It's often too little, too late. And this is often what can result. So um, as I mentioned, the parasite feeding is damaging to the bee itself, but the, these mites can also pass viruses. And these viruses can result into deformities. So one in particular here called deformed wing virus, the uh, bee will acquire this um, basically when it's being fed on in an immature stage. And as it's developing, its wings will come out deformed. So that bee will never fly. And that, that's also gonna be really problematic for the colony. The bee won't fly, its lifespan will be reduced. This is really bad news for the colony. Okay, so as I mentioned, tropolelops mite is not in the United States and Utah participates in something called the National Honeybee Survey. And that is where um, if beekeepers have eight or more hives, we come out and we take samples of live bees and um, baby bees, and we do what's called a brood bump. So if you look at those photos in the middle there, you'll see a metal pan and you'll see a frame. And that's basically us um, smacking the frame on the metal pan with the idea of we're trying to dislodge bee brood as well as any parasites that might be in there. We then send these parasite or we then send these samples to another lab. They're tested for viruses, um, other um, honeybee diseases, and they check for this tropolelops mite. They're looking for eggs, they're looking for immature stage, they're looking for adults. We also just tried to look for um, tropolelops mite in our day-to-day -day inspections. Um, however, they can be difficult to uh, detect, especially if the levels are low. They're very tiny mites. So this is one thing that we are doing as a state to try to um, get ahead of this tropolelops mite. And um, this is, as the name suggests, it's a national effort. So many other states are participating in this. The idea being if we could find tropolelops mite quickly, if it were in introduced, then we could um, maybe do something to um, stop it. So, you know, basically the, the summary is here, this is a pest that we don't have in the United States. Um, it uh, is able to uh, increase its population far faster than the parasite that we already have in the United States that's already causing us lots of problems. And um, we really are going to need beekeepers to be vigilant about this, to keep an eye out for this. So we ask that you report if you either think you see this or you do see this. All right, let's move on to a, another pest. This is Northern Giant Hornet. It's actually gone by some other different names. It's formerly known officially as Asian Giant Hornet, and it was informally known as the Murder Hornet. Um, so there was a lot of media attention around this um, pest. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the name murder hornet was a little bit of hyperbole. Um, it is known to kill between 30 and 50 people in Japan every year. So it's not that it doesn't kill people. However, um, it, it doesn't just attack people unprovoked. Um, that being said, all the media attention around it has been good because people have been looking for it. So this is a rather large hornet, okay? It's, it, um, in the US, there's nothing bigger than this. So it's one and a half to 2.25 inches long. And um, the, the lower end of that is going to be more like the size of a worker. And the upper end of that is gonna be more the size of a queen. Now also notice that its head is like kind of an orangish yellow. And basically the entirety of the head is this color. It's a solid color. The thorax is dark brown. And again, it's mostly dark brown. There's a little bit of uh, yellow spotting on there. Um, and then the abdomen is banded. It almost looks like honeybee banding. 
Now I point these features out because we're gonna take a look at some um, other uh, wasps that are frequently confused with the Asian giant hornet. And knowing a few of these things can help you to differentiate them from ones we already have here in Utah. As I mentioned, um, these are known to sting people. Um, they have a stinger that's longer than most stinging Hymenoptera. So Hymenoptera being the order that these insects belong to. The stinger is actually so long that a conventional bee suit is not going to protect you against attack. You are going to need something thicker um, because the sting can go through that. And then it should be noted that the venom, um, they actually put out quite a bit of venom. And so um, it, the, this is a very painful sting if you get it. Um, I've, I've never been stung by one, um, but my understanding is it's kind of like um, a like a bullet ant or um, you know one of those things that really hurts when you get, get stung by it. Also note that it is damaging to honeybee colonies. We will go into that a little bit more on a subsequent slide. So in its uh, native distribution, it's basically found from India to like the, the far east of Asia, so kind of Japan. It was um, in recent years detected in Washington State and British Columbia. And there's actually been an eradication effort going on. And um, there's some good news to report about that. The economic importance of this is that it is a pest of honeybees and honeybee colonies. So um, this these can, um, under certain circumstances, really devastate hives. And I'll um, go into that just a little bit. The most common way that these things attack hives is um, basically what's called hunting. And this is where we have um, workers of these northern giant hornets, they kind of hang out in front of a beehive. And they just wait for a bee to come out and they snatch it, they dismember it, and then they bring it back to their colony. These are social insects just like um, honeybees. So that, that's kind of the most typical damage that they'll do to a honeybee colony. And it's not super severe when they're doing just that. If they're picking off a few honeybees here and there, um, usually the colony can absorb that. that. That's not usually the problem. But one of the bigger problems is what's called a slaughter attack. And this is where we get a group of these northern giant hornet, sometimes as many as 50. And they're all hanging out in front of a hive. And they're basically all just attacking the honeybee colony um, in a coordinated fashion. The honeybees usually don't fare very well uh, in these circumstances. They, uh, um, the northern giant hornets will often prevail in these um, circumstances. And then they'll take on a, a different stage, which is called an occupy stage, basically where the northern giant hornets take over the insides of that hive, the honey and pollen and whatever else they want. And it's actually, this is where these northern giant hornets will be their most defensive. When they've basically taken over a beehive and they've, They've, uh, they, they've killed off the beehive and then they've occupied it. Um, it basically makes them a lot more defensive. Um, and again, uh, we just don't need this. We've got already so many problems in beekeeping today that we don't need um, a whole new bee to have to deal with. So please report if detected. So the life cycle of these colonies is um, kind of interesting. They're known as annual colonies, not perennial colonies. So honeybee colonies, for instance, you know, survive the winter and they can live multiple years. Um, with these northern giant hornet colonies, though, they're basically the colony dies each year and the only surviving member is going to be a queen. So we'll just start this life cycle with a queen that has been mated and she overwinters. Um, and you can see in, uh, on this will, we've got January. And these uh, queens, they generally uh, will winter in the soil. And then between February and March, these queens will come out and they will start um, constructing a subterranean nest. So these like to be kind of underground in cavities that have maybe already been um, hollowed out. Now the queen, she's the only one in the colony at that point, right? So she has to do all the work. She has to construct the nest. She's got to lay eggs. She's got to take care of those babies. She's got to go do foraging to keep herself going and then feed the babies as well. So she's the only one at, at the beginning. However, as the eggs hatch and the larvae grow and they pupate, very similar to the, the honeybee life cycle we looked at, she will finally have some daughters to start doing some work and, do, and helping her. So these daughters will begin to take over the foraging duties and the brood care, taking care of the baby hornets. And this will allow her just to continue to lay eggs and focus on that. 
And so when those workers start to take over those foraging duties, that's when you'll start to see um, some attacks on the honeybee colonies. So we've got between June and July here, we've got some um, northern giant hornet workers and they're basically going out and they're, looks like they're doing the hunting, right? Just one, we got one of them kind of sitting in front of the hive and it's going to be picking off um, some honeybees. By August, the colony is, is fully grown, um, kind of at max population. And just after that, that's when the bee attacks will start to increase, kind of in September. Then as fall comes, um, that's when things start to wind down. Um, reproductives, so uh, male uh, hornets will be produced and they will fly off and mate with um, uh, different uh, female hornets. And those will basically be the next generation. Those ones that, uh, the queens that are mated in the fall will be the ones that winter over. But basically all those um, workers will perish and um, the original queen will perish as well. So let's take a look at Northern Giant Hornet compared to some of the things that are often turned in uh, to Department of Ag uh, pictures and uh, specimens. And uh, hopefully you can kind of see the difference between um, some of these. Maybe the closest looking one to it is what's called the Western Cicada Killer. And you know, just the, the body shape, uh, kind of the patterning and the, the relative size, um, they're very close uh, looking to each other. But again, let's point out some things that can help you to differentiate. Uh, notice on the right, that's the Northern Giant Hornet. And on the left is the Western Cicada Killer. The Northern Giant Hornet, uh, the head completely um, yellowish orange, the thorax um, completely dark brown. And then notice the patterns on the abdomen. With the Northern Giant Hornet, they're basically just kind of these thick bands of stripes. With the um, Western Cicada Killer, we've got um, kind of some more interesting patterns going on, okay? We've got areas that kind of come to points. Um, so that banding can, can be really useful in telling um, them apart. Another one that sometimes is turned in is the Bald-Faced Hornet, and um, it's quite a bit smaller. Um, it doesn't have the same patterning, so that's a little easier to tell apart. European hornet, this is another one that looks um, somewhat similar. But again, you know, look at these different features. Look at the, um, the banding on the back of the abdomen and the coloration on the head and the thorax. The pigeon tremex. So um, pigeon tremex actually isn't um, a, a wasp, it's a sawfly, which is just kind of a, insects that are closely related to um, wasps, bees, and ants. Um, but again, that, you know, this looks like a very ferocious insect, right? And so people often turn these in um, to us thinking that this might be a northern giant hornet. Um, interestingly enough, pigeon tremex doesn't attack people. I, I mean, it might bite you if you grabbed one and you were really bothering it, but um, it's not known to attack people. Various pa paper wasps and various yellow jackets are often confused as well. And I point these out just to help you. But, you know, I always want folks to err on the side of caution. If you're not sure, it's always best just to turn it into us, um, either sending us a photo or, or uh, submitting a specimen to our lab. Um, you know, we don't expect you to be experts in this. And so um, if you have any doubts, um, please just turn them in. You know, um, I, I mentioned that this is a pest of honeybees and um, many of you have maybe seen um, a really interesting defense that honeybees have against this Northern giant hornet on um, YouTube videos. There's actually some really cool YouTube videos. Um, and this is just kind of a, an animation that kind of shows you what happens. But basically honeybees are not defenseless against these Northern giant hornets. They have their own coordinated attack where they can come together as a group of workers and they do what's called, uh, they, they ball the insect. They form basically this, this ball. And what they're doing is they are heating up that hornet and depriving them of oxygen such that it will kill them. It's really a cool defense. It's, it's really neat. I mean, it's really like, you know, the, the underdog, you know, taking on the, the heavyweight champion, so to speak. And um, what's interesting about this though, is again, you know, where the Northern Giant Hornet is native to, the honeybees that are there are much better equipped to do this defense. So for instance, that Asiatic honeybee, the, the one that we saw the picture of earlier where the um, varroa mite came from, they are excellent at this defense. They can summon up to 500 workers within a matter of minutes and ball that hornet and really just cook it to death and deprive it of oxygen. So they, they're excellent at this. 
Now, European honeybees, the honeybees we have in this country, they can do this as well, but they're just not as good at it. Okay, they just haven't had the time to, to co-evolve the strategy and really refine it. So they will summon workers to do this, but um, they're not going to come up with 500 bees. It's, it's going to be far fewer than that. And what that means is that either um, this hornet doesn't get cooked to death, um, either it, it just fails, or it just takes much longer for this to happen. So the point of this is, while European honeybees do have some defenses against this northern giant hornet, um, they're not great. And again, we just don't need another honeybee pest. We're already dealing with so many problems in beekeeping. Anyone that's a beekeeper will tell you this. So it is something we are very concerned about. Now, um, here's what's uh, called a suitability map. This is basically uh, a scientific study that was done and kind of evaluating, you know, Northern Giant Hornet. We know we've had it in Washington and British Columbia, you know, and they are trying to eradicate it. What happens if they don't eradicate it though? Where is this hornet likely to end up and how problematic will it be? Well, this study, this was done by Zoo uh, Looney and Crowder, and um, basically they were evaluating precipitation and temperature preferences, um, as well as elevation. And what seems to be the case is that this insect kind of likes moderate to low temperatures, it likes lots of precipitation, and it likes low elevation. So that's actually really good news for us, okay? Because if you look at this map, the dark purple are the areas where this pest is going to do the best. And, you know, if you just look at Utah, you'll notice there's some sprinklings of blue. Um, on the, if you look at this uh, chart here, we've got the human footprint that is in blue and then the climate suitability, which is in yellow. And so the combination of those two things is kind of the, the purple. So that's the sweet spot, right? Of there's humans around that will, be bothered by these pests, but then there's the climate suitability. So basically Utah does have, um, you know, some suitability, but it's not going to be um, favored uh, or favorable habitat to them. So it's expected that it may be like a small high beetle where it either gets here, but it just isn't able to really complete life cycles and, and create a stable population. Or it does get here and it just kind of becomes part of the, the background fauna of the um, wasp population. You know, we really don't want to find out though. <laughs> That's one thing. You sometimes give people this information and they're like, oh, okay, well, good. We don't have to worry about it. Well, again, um, sometimes the insect doesn't read the study. They don't read the book, right? Insects are going to do what they're going to do. So um, while the suitability map is, is encouraging, it is something that we still take seriously, and um, we would appreciate um, you reporting if you see anything that uh, looks like Northern Giant Hornet through a photo or a specimen. You aren't sure that it isn't Northern Giant Hornet, because um, we just don't want this here. And uh, some of the other good news in summary is that, um, you know, Washington State, they've um, done this eradication effort. They've been tracking down uh, colonies of Northern Giant Hornet and destroying them. And, um, for two consecutive years, they have not found any northern giant hornets in any of their traps. So this is a really encouraging sign. It's possible that they may be able to eradicate that. And that would be fantastic because it just means that the other states aren't really going to have to um, worry about this for um, some time. But again, um, please report it to us if you think you found one. Okay, and then finally, we're going to talk about varroa mite. And varroa mite is basically a pest that is here in Utah. It has a stable population and it creates enormous damage and it's invasive. So this is a tiny mite. It's, it's bigger than that triple laylops mite, but it's still very tiny, about one fifteenth of an inch. And um, the adult here is, is dark brown. Um, the white one is um, an immature. You're not likely to see those immatures though, because um, they would be under capping, um, basically trying to complete their life cycle as the honeybees are um, going through their um, larval and pupil stage. The damage they do to colonies is enormous. So this is, um, rural mites can do the, the same sort of um, damage that you'll see with the playlops mite where we saw the hygienic behavior where the bees were pulling it out and basically we're losing a lot of um, baby bees as a result because the bees are trying to um, uh, interrupt that uh, life cycle of the pest. 
But this is another thing that varroa mite does. And um, if you haven't been in a beehive, it may be difficult to appreciate what's going on here. But basically where you see white, um, that's where, that's a larval bee. And that larval bee has basically just kind of become like a sludge. It's dead. It's not ever going to become an adult bee. And it's likely that it died this way because the varroa mite transmits viruses. So the basically the varroa mite went in here, fed on this little larvae, and um, as a result, it acquired a virus and it died. So instead of um, staying as a little you know, worm that becomes a pupa, that becomes an adult bee, it doesn't do that. And look at all those little white, uh, I kind of call them water balloons, little water balloons. Those were all bees that could have potentially been adult bees but could not because varroa mite um, parasitized them and gave them a virus. Now there's some bees that will still go through um, the larval and pupal stage after having varroa mite feeding on them. However, they can, as adults, exhibit what's this called the deformed wing virus. So the bee um, on the top, that's a bee that has healthy wings, okay? And th it, that one is going to be able to fly the one on the bottom acquired deformed wing virus. And as it was developing in that larval and pupil stage, it basically the wings um, came out deformed. So that bee is not going to be able to fly. And it's not gonna live as long either. That bee is, is not gonna live as long as the one that's um, up above it. Current distribution, Roma is now everywhere. And I'm gonna do a little history to show you kind of how it's everywhere. It's really unfortunate, but just it's basically on every con. And the economic importance of this, it really can't be overstated. This is the most problematic pest that we have in beekeeping today. It by far kills more colonies in this state than any other cause. If there was one thing that we could just magically get rid of to help um, honeybees, this would be my top pick. If we could just put varroa mite back in its native range where it doesn't cause problems, um, that would be a good thing. However, we don't ask that you report varroa mite. Um, if you keep bees, you're going to have varroa mite, and really the only thing you can do is to control the infestation. So um, we're not asking people to report it to us. We know that you're likely to get it, and we're just encouraging you to um, take care of it. Um, so here's the life cycle of varroa mite. I'm not gonna go over this too much more because um, it's very similar to the life cycle of the tropolalops mite. But one thing I will note is that um, the varroa mite um, does not build up its population quite as quickly as the tropolalops mite. And this diagram shows you a little bit why. If we go to number nine and right above that, you'll see three mites there, okay? And one is dark, kind of a, a dark reddish brown, and then the other two are kind of pink. Well, the two that are in pink, that's meant to symbolize mites whose exoskeleton did not harden enough during the, um, during the, uh, pupation of the bee to be able to survive environmental conditions. So basically we had one mama mite that went in and we only had one um, bro mite that came out. Now this is just one example of that. However, the average is that for every one mama bro mite that goes in, you basically have 1.5 bro mite that actually come out that can survive um, and parasitize bees and continue its life cycle. So, um, you know, in this case, it's one that survived, but in another case, it might be two. And on average, it's 1.5. So this kind of maybe illustrates why the varroa mite population takes a little longer to um, uh, build up in population and become a problem. It's uh, because we have fewer mites that emerge um, that are actually able to survive the uh, environment. Okay, varroa mite history, and this is a sad one, okay? Um, in 1951, this is the first detection on honeybees, and this was, I, I should say, European honeybees. This was in Singapore. In 1972, it was found in Eastern Europe in Czechoslovakia. 1976, it was found in Argentina. This was the first detection in the Americas. 1987, um, finally in the United States, and Florida was the first state it was found. 1992, first confirmed detection in Utah. Again, it was probably here before that, but that was the first confirmed year. Hawaii was the last state to get varroa mite. So for a long time, Hawaii was varroa mite free, but in 2007, that uh, ended. Now, there was one continent 
in the whole world that kept hun honeybees, European honeybees, that didn't have varroa mite for such a long time. And unfortunately, that ended in 2022. That was Australia. So um, varroa mite was detected in 2022, and that meant that pretty much every continent where we keep uh, European honeybees, varroa mite is now present and is causing lots of problems. Um, so as I mentioned, we're not asking you to report varroa mite, but we do urge you to control varroa mite. How do you do that? Well, I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but I will note that we have three easy steps for people to remember. One of those is to measure, right? and you can find instructions on how to measure varroa mites at this website. You should be checking for varroa mites at least monthly. If through your measuring, you find that varroa mite levels are excessive, and you know, typically if you're doing one of these powdered sugar rolls or alcohol washes that's illustrated here on step one, um, if you're finding you know, um, four or five mites that come out of this uh, test that you perform, that's usually an indication that um, the varroa mite levels need to be controlled. And then finally, this is the hardest step for folks, repeat. So varroa mite is such a challenging pest to manage because it isn't just a one and done sort of thing usually. We don't usually identify varroa mites in the hive, treat the hives, and then we're done for the season. The mites um, will often reinfest a colony and this will be bees, um, basically bees will be able to pick them up from other colonies that are nearby. And as a result, the beekeeper really needs to continue measuring after they've done their treatment, first of all, to make sure the treatment worked, but also to make sure they don't get reinfested. And oftentimes they do. And basically you have to treat again. And I can tell you as um, a beekeeper myself, um, I basically have to treat my bees at least three times a year. Um, because they continue to get reinfested. So continuing monitoring and treating as needed is um, a really crucial part that um, a lot of folks miss. Okay, so the summary about uh, varroa mite, you don't need to report it, but you do need to, um, uh, you need to monitor for it and you need to control the infestations. If you don't, your colony um, will die I, I eventually. Now, you may have heard of reports of folks that have, um, there's, varroa mite resistant bees in other areas and things like that. Um, there are bee breeders that are working on this. They're trying to um, breed uh, honeybees that basically are more resistant to varroa mite and they're having some success. And there are um, feral colonies that are known in certain parts of the United States that are um, more resistant to um, varroa mite. Um, however, those colonies usually are not very good honey producers. They tend to be smaller colonies, and um, sometimes they can be more aggressive. So the interesting thing about this is when we breed for, when we try to breed for a quality that we're looking for in honeybee, we sometimes lose other things. And the honeybee, the European honeybee that we have today is a product of hundreds of years of breeding, trying to get a bee that produces a lot of honey, that doesn't swarm on us, it is gentle. And now we're trying to add one more thing on top of it, which is we would like it to be varroa mite resistant. People are working on it. We're making some progress, but we're just not there yet where you can basically just buy varroa mite resistant bees, put them in a box and forget about them. We're unfortunately not there yet. Now throughout this presentation, you might be going, well, how are all these invasive pests getting here? How, how are we ending up with these? Are we importing bees from other countries? The answer is no. So the United States actually has really strict laws against importing um, honeybees into the United States. Um, there's some uh, exceptions to that where um, they can be imported for research, but it's, it's highly regulated. And so no, we are not getting these um, pests by the importation of honeybees themselves. Internationally speaking, the most common way that these are arriving are on shipping containers. And you might be going, well, why would there be bees on shipping containers? Well, honeybees have a behavior what's called swarming, and that's basically how honeybee colonies reproduce. Um, a honeybee colony that survives winter, goes into spring, um, will often split into half. So basically, um, a queen will, uh, the, the queen that was already there, will take half of the bees and leave, and the, there will be a new queen that's left behind, and she will basically be there with the bees that are um, uh, part of the original colony. And these swarms, they will fly and take off and they will look for a new home. And they often find homes in, you know, tree holes or 
um, soffits in a house or um, just anything that's a, a cavity. But if these honeybees are close to a port, they might, this swarm might find its way onto a shipping container. And that shipping container will carry those bees to another country. And then when they arrive there, they hop off and lo and behold, we have invasive honeybee pests. So there's a number of um, efforts that are being made on this front through customs to try to control these pathways and, and minimize the spread of invasive honeybee pests. Um, but there's not really a whole lot you can do as an individual um, that doesn't work for customs on this front. However, there is more that you can do on the region pathways to how we use um, bee pests. And, um, you know, basically bees, honeybees, one of the things that makes it so useful compared to other um, native bees, which are also important. But one thing that's kind of distinctive is we can put honeybees in boxes and we can move them around. And that that is so helpful because, you know, plants don't always, are agriculturally important crops, they don't bloom all at the same time. And so with honeybee colonies, we can take these hives and we can move them from um, agriculturally important crop to agriculturally important crop and basically have those bees present um, as they bloom. And that is um, one thing that really makes um, our modern agricultural system work well. Unfortunately, it is a way in which we can move um, bee diseases and pests though. And so um, that, it, it doesn't mean we need to stop migratory beekeeping. We, we, we really can't. We have to have migratory beekeeping to maintain the agricultural systems that we have today. Um, however, there's a number of steps we can take to reduce these regional pathways. And they are, so one of them is, first of all, if you're a beekeeper, please register with the state. Um, if you have 20 or fewer colonies, it's $10, and it is a great value. Um, if we do have a beekeeping emergency, then we know who to contact in that area. You also will receive disease and pest alerts. Um, if, there is a, is, if there's a disease of concern, um, you will get a notification about that. Um, we also offer free lab testing and house calls. Uh, as a bee inspector, I literally will come to your house and look through your hive to help you determine what problems you might have, okay? So it's a great value and it's a great way to help mitigate these um, uh, invasive pest problems. Regularly inspect your hives. So in the beekeeping world, it's often talked about there's bee havers and there's beekeepers. And bee havers are basically folks that put the bees in the box and they don't do much with them and almost certainly the bees die. And, you know, some folks, I, I get that they're, that's, it's kind of an appealing idea that like, well, you know, bees, they should, we should just kind of leave them alone and do their thing. But you have to remember that the honeybees that we have today, again, they, they've been bred for hundreds of years to suit our needs. So they're very similar to a pet, like a dog or a cat you wouldn't be a dog or cat haver, right? That wouldn't be considered ethical to just basically just let the cat or dog fend for itself. I'm not gonna, you know, check its ears and make sure it's losing weight. And, you know, you've got to take care of the pet, right? Well, that's very much the situation we are in with honeybees. We need to inspect our hives on a regular basis, checking for disease, checking for pests, managing those things when they happen. And, you know, doing other things too, feeding when, um, there is not a nectar flow. Um, splitting the hives instead of allowing them to swarm. There's a whole medley of things we need to do as a beekeeper to um, keep them healthy and uh, keep them from causing problems for other folks.